Hello, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining today for our webinar, Why Trust and Privacy, by the way, are going to be the biggest challenge and opportunity for marketers in the 2020s. Um, and gosh, we're in the 2020s. I mean, that's kind of hard to believe. Um, but yeah, here we are. If you don't know who I am, my name is Robert Rose. I am the Chief Strategy Officer here at TCA, the Content Advisory. And we're just an organization that is all chock-a-block full of thinking about content, content strategy, and how it really uh, affects what what it is you're trying to do. Now, before we get started here, let me just uh, let me just get through some quick housekeeping tips that'll help you really get the most out of today's webinar. So the first thing is is that ask questions. We'll have some time at the end here for some Q and A, and those that we don't get to, we'll certainly be happy to answer for you offline um, in a blog post that we'll follow up here with. The slides are going to advance automatically. We've heard some uh, rumors about GoToWebinar being a little slow on the uh, drop, as it were. So our our apologies in advance if some of these lag a little bit um, on the uh, on the internet. Um, you're going to be able to download, however, the presentation. There's a widget in the console if you can look uh, in it, and you can download the presentation directly at any time um, in there, and it'll be available for you. A streaming archive, however, of the event is going to be sent to you within the next 24 to 48 hours, where you'll also be able to watch it um, recorded if you have to leave um, or if anything uh, if anything goes wrong technologically. So we're also going to be following up in about a week with a larger ebook version of this presentation, and basically that's going to be uh, Tim's uh, white paper on this exact topic. So how uh, really data and all of that is a big opportunity to for us as marketers. And of course, join the conversation. Why don't you hashtag us up at Story Helping? It's a, a wonderful hashtag there, and uh, we're all uh, excited about it. So. Let's talk a little bit about what it is we're going to talk about. Um, before I quickly go through that, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about the content advisory. We offer a number of things, including strategic planning, corporate education, retained advisory. We've done so for a bunch of customers. Um, and if you're looking for education, uh, advisory services, or road mapping for your content marketing or content strategy, let us know. We'd love to actually help. All right, enough about that. And let's get to what we're going to talk about today. So, we're talking about data, we're talking about privacy, and we have got one of the best in the business in terms to talk about that. Um, Dr. Tim Walters, my friend, my colleague, uh, is our VP and privacy lead here at the Content Advisory. You can see his Twitter handle there at Tim underscore Walters. And of course, Tim is just one of the most renowned experts when it comes to looking at data privacy, things like the GDPR, the new CCPA, and all of the other things, and how, by the way, marketers are creating better experiences as a result of that. And so Tim and I will have a bit of a discussion as well as a presentation on how all of this is starting out. And to get to that, let's actually let's actually start with something, right? Let's start with uh, a question. Now, many of you might be thinking about, you know, when you signed up for this webinar, why do I even really care about this? And this is something, by the way, we see all over the planet with companies which are going, yeah, we think about data and privacy, but it doesn't really apply to us, right? Because we're marketing people, and so that's a legal thing, or it's an IT issue, or gosh, it's just a pain in the butt, but it's something we have to deal with almost like a tax. Um, and But whether your role is like more content specific, it's more sales specific, or broadly marketing, or customer experience, I think there's something that we need to talk about. Um, and I want to start this off by one, welcoming Tim to the show here and, and also ask him, look, Tim, why are we planning to make all of these people in the audience today, these busy marketers, think about privacy and data protection for not just the rest of this hour, but, you know, sort of ongoing? Yeah, right. Hi, Robert. It's great to be uh, on, on board again with you. Um, yeah, I hope that I can justify why people are going to be uh, paying attention to privacy from a marketing perspective for uh, the re for the rest of the hour and, and for, you know, many weeks and years beyond that as well, if possible. Let me just point out at the top that uh, that paper that we're going to send around the ebook is on the same topic, certainly, around the opportunities and the challenges of data privacy going forward. Uh, but it is not simply a repeat of the content of the of the webinar. So there'll be some fresh uh, some fresh news information data in that paper that you should uh, probably attend to as well when we get to it. So, you know, th there's an obvious answer to the question about why marketers should pay attention to uh, to data privacy issues. 
uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you in advance, I'm not sure this obvious answer is the correct one, but nevertheless, we have to address the obvious one. And that is, if you take pretty much, you know, at this point, in, going into 2020, if you take pretty much any four letters of the alphabet and arrange them in just about any random order, it seems like you've got the name or the acronym or the initialism for a new or revised or proposed data regulation. So, of course, there's the European uh, GDPR. In Brazil, there's the LGPD, which I always confuse with the L, uh, LPGA. Uh, there's in Hong Kong, the uh, Personal Data Privacy Ordinance, which has actually been around since the 70s, but has recently been significantly updated uh, to, in, in many ways that reflect GDPR requirements. Uh, there's California CCPA, of course, that's probably the one that's on top of top of mind of most of our listeners who I believe are, are coming from North America, the California Citizens Privacy Act. There's a New York Privacy Act, which, okay, did not pass in the 2019 legislative period, but I'm willing to bet, you know, I would put down 10 or 15, 10 or 15 dollars that says it will pass in some form and in some form that's going to be pretty restrictive in 2020. That's my bet. And of course, Nevada always wants to party in a special way, so their bill is just called Senate Bill 220. And so, at, in fact, at the beginning of 2019, some 23 countries on, on the on the count of the International Association of Privacy Professionals had or were preparing to enact privacy legislation, much of it explicitly, explicitly modeled after the GDPR. In the U.S., as you see here, 27 states introduced nearly 150 privacy bills of some kind in 2019. 17 of those were enacted, and again, many of those will be back in the 2020 legislative period. And, and equally, as you're aware, many of these regulations carry infamously large penalties under the GDPR. Here's just a few. Google, 50 million euros for improper and manip manip manipulative uh, consent practices. British Airways has a proposed fine from the, from the UK authorities of 183 million pounds for poor data security that led to the exposure of some 500,000 uh, customer records. And a real estate firm in Germany, Deutsche Wohnung, uh, has a proposed fine of 14.5 million euros for simply improperly retaining data, that is, retaining it after the original processing purpose had was completed or had expired. Under the CCPA, the maximum fine for, for an intentional violation, as opposed to an unintentional one, is $7,500. Now, that seems laughably small uh, when you until you learn that uh, each customer data record counts as a separate violation. So if the CCPA had been in effect, this is theoretical, if it had been in effect when Facebook allowed Cambridge Analytica to illegitimately use the data of some 24.6 million California residents, that could have meant a fine of over $184 billion. So here's takeaway number one. There are literally millions of reasons or even billions of reasons when you consider from the perspective of the fines for your organization to comply with data regulations. And marketers and marketing must play a vital central role in this effort. But, and here's why I think this obvious answer isn't the correct answer or the most appropriate answer, but that's still not why you should care about privacy. <laughs> okay, well, all right then, <laughs> I'll take the bait. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and uh, you know, spoiler alert, I already know the answer, <laughs> but um, <laughs> you know, so you've taken away the takeaway as it were. Um, and so I, I, again, I'm, I'm sure there's another, right? Where, so, you know, even out there, if you think about, you know, marketers and, and thinking about, okay, the fines are one thing, but we're not Facebook, we're not Google, we're not, you know, British Air, we're, you know, a smaller organization, and maybe it doesn't apply to us, and, you know, all of those things. What What is the, you know, what is truly the reason that we marketers should be caring about this so much? Yeah, Robert, you, you're, you're guessing, I mean, you know me so well. <laughs> You might say you know me consummately for oh, this other this oh, other yeah. force this force that I think you should be paying attention to is in fact consumers. So here's some fascinating data from a recent survey of U.S. consumers. Um, a thousand 
uh, housing consumers representative of the adult population, only 10% had heard of both the GDPR and the CCPA. Now that's a pretty high bar because there's no reason why man on the street or woman on the street in the US should necessarily know about the GDPR. But secondly, almost 70% had not heard of either the GDPR or the CCPA. And even if an, uh, you know a normal citizen is uh, aware of the regulation, they're certainly not going to be knowledgeable about its details. So in short, your consumers are basically ignorant uh, about the regulation, uh, and they have neither the desire nor the ability to judge whether your organization is compliant with this or that legal requirement, like the CCPA or Senate Bill 220 or the GDPR. And so while regulatory compliance is utterly mandatory, inescapable, it can never be a competitive differentiator or the basis of distinctive Custom, distinctive, unusual, the competitively um, dis, uh, ad, advantageous com customer experiences. And that points to what we think is the real reason, finally, <laughs> why marketers can and must care about privacy. Namely, we are now experiencing, we are very fully into an undeniable and seemingly unstoppable sea change in consumer attitudes about unfettered data collection. So for example, only 17% of some 6,000 uh, adult consumers surveyed in the US, the UK, France, and Germany said that it is ethical to even track behavior to target ads. Nearly 70% in the US and UK said they don't trust how businesses use their data. A similar percentage of Americans in late 2018 said they support a US GDPR, a, a US version of the GDPR. And in a 2017 global survey of tens of thousands of consumers, when asked to name the top reasons they would abandon a provider, not think negatively of them, not, not give them a, a, you know, a negative uh, net promoter score, abandon a provider, it was if they use my data without my knowledge. Our fellow analyst, uh, Horace Deju, has compared this shift in attitudes about data privacy to the reversal in societal acceptance of smoking which you know, obviously went through a dramatic 360 degree turn from the time when the army was actually handing out cigarettes to soldiers. Uh, in 2015, Diju predicted a future. He thought he could foresee a future in which the harvesting of personal data will, he says, become toxic, taboo, the most distasteful, hateful thing. And he was absolutely right, except that future which he foresaw has arrived not in decades, but in a couple of years and it's been fueled by these seemingly endless data scandals. Now, fair enough, we need to pause here and look at the evidence for this shift because the industry, as, as it's called, the uh, uh, Interactive Advertising Bureau, the IAB, the Direct Marketing Association, the DMA, as you see here, Axiom and other big data brokers, Facebook, Google, et cetera, they can and will always come up with survey results that purport to show that people are happy with the status quo exchange of personal data for online services. So let's look at the counter evidence. Here's one great validation of the shift. As you, as you may know, the CCPA was not created by some faceless bureaucrats in Sacramento. It started out as a citizen's ballot initiative to curtail non-consensual data collection. And the data giants in California, Facebook, Google, et cetera, realized quite slowly how popular this initiative was. The, the organizers report that in the spring of 2018, as they were trying to gather signatures, all they had to do was hold up a pin on the sidewalk and say, Cambridge Analytica. And people passing by were like, show me where to sign. And so it's only once it became clear that this measure would not only get on the ballot, but would likely pass in November, 2018, that the industry hastily got behind the CCPA as a legislative bill in order to keep the more restrictive citizens initiative off of the ballot. Or again, more evidence, consider how the discourse around privacy legislation has transformed common practices that sit right at the core of much of your own digital marketing into or has painted it as unacceptable black hat behavior. So just a few, just a couple of years ago, I mean, Robert and I had been in 
innumerable analyst briefings where you hear the CEO or the CTO of some major vendor saying, basically, the first thing you need to do is go out and try to grab all the personal data you possibly can from your own properties, from third party aggregators, et cetera, et cetera, build this giant pool of data in order to use it, maybe eventually in order to get the right message to the right person at the, at the right time. Last summer, 2019, New York State Senator Kevin Thomas said, I quote, they're sharing our data and we're getting targeted, which sounds in retrospect, I mean, just from, from the perspective of a couple of years ago, sounds like a rather harmless description of what it means to do targeted marketing. But for Thomas and for so many others, this is now a self-evident justification for introducing the New York Privacy Act. They're sharing our data and we're getting targeted. That And it must stop, right? And when introducing the CCPA in late 2019, that is the final version of the CCPA after all the amendments and attempted amendments, the California Attorney General stated that what stated what now passes for for common sense, I think, people should not have to face a choice between giving up privacy and participating in digital interactions. In other words, the former accepted marketing aspiration, build profiles, target people, is now deemed increasingly to be an unacceptable irritation. And finally, final piece of evidence, and I think the most the most damning one, you know, in a capitalist system, the clearest val validation of a social shift is when businesses begin attributing financial value to it. So like when, you know, uh, McDonald's shifted from the styrofoam clamshell to a paper clamshell in the light of, uh, you know, consumer outrage at the at the waste. So, uh, as we've seen recently, Verizon wrote off over four and a half billion dollars in the value of Oath, which was created by uh, the combination of AOL and, and Yahoo, and it was supposed to be basically a targeted, targeted marketing platform, a content and targeted marketing platform. And they did so in part because the Verizon executives were, I'm quoting, wary of alienating lucrative wireless customers by using subscriber data to boost Oath's advertising revenue. That is basically potentially irritating their lucrative customers, their cellular customers, by sharing too much of their data with Oath. And more recently, and uh, Robert has talked about this on a couple of recent webinars, Google did an about, about face and agreed to phase out third-party cookies in the Chrome browser following the lead that has been long established by other browsers like Firefox and Safari, let alone privacy-centric browsers like Brave. So in short, here's the second takeaway, and I'm not gonna take this one away after I give it to you. The four letter acronym that we want you to take away today is GDPR, but not the European regulation, not the general data protection regulation, but what we perhaps a little irritatingly call the real GDPR, a global data privacy revolution. This real GDPR is not fundamentally about or based in the dozens of emerging uh, of current and emerging regulations. It is a cultural and social force that is fed by and based in your consumers, your prospects and your customers, anxiety and growing anger about data use and abuse. Now, maybe you've had the dubious pleasure of reading the GDPR or the CCPA. In fact, the GDPR, although it's much longer, is a lot easier to read than the CCPA, I have to tell you. But I managed to track down the full text, the complete text of this real GDPR and I'm re revealing it for the first time uh, on this webinar. Now, if that's still too long, didn't read TLDR, here's the interactive content version. Open up your phone, switch to the selfie lens, look into that camera, and every time you make a decision about data protection, data privacy, ask that consumer you're looking at what they would want. Or if that consumer you're looking at happens to be one of those people who thinks that they don't care about how their data is used, ask how that consumer would want the data of their children or of their elderly parents treated by, uh, by a brand or a publisher. So the conclusion of this section, you must help your organization, of course you must help your organization comply with data regulations in order to satisfy regulators and avoid potentially massive fines. But 
as marketers, you must and should attend to and care about privacy in order to satisfy consumers and avoid potentially far more massive financial penalties due to non-competitive customer experiences. So that brings us to a very interesting question, which is what does it mean? Um, and as Tim has outlined here, so the idea here being that we have to care about this. We have to care about because this is something that is not only something we feel like we have to comply with um, in a legal sense, there is a spirit of this that we need to comply with and a opportunity for us as marketers to start to take advantage of this. Because um, as we start thinking about going forward here, this can become a differentiating strategy for us in the mind uh, of the consumer. Go ahead and switch slides. And so when we start thinking about this new data economy, where do we start looking at this, uh, Mr. Tim? How do we start thinking about this idea of the new data economy? Yeah. Yeah, so first, uh, I think we need, uh, one, we need to acknowledge that the shift has taken place, right? This That this data privacy revolution we're pointing to fundamentally and and evidently, ir excuse me, irreversibly shifts the terms and the rules around data price process, data processing. So we move from personal data super abundance, which, you know, you could famously vacuum it up like exhaust, to uh, relative uh, quite uh, severe data scarcity. We move from kind of a wild west scenario where you were re, uh, allowed or even encouraged uh, by by your vendors, by by analysts like us, frankly, I must admit, to be a data predator to a regulated or a tamed environment in which you're expected both by both the regulators and, and consumers to be a, a data shepherd, a data fiduciary. And we move from a world of big data to what we call the world of beg data, in which collecting personal data for marketing and customer experience, and many other reasons as well, means striking fully transparent bargains with fully informed consumers. And the, 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 the rub, however, is that while consumers are increasingly embracing privacy in, in sometimes quite extreme ways, they still want and expect and demand to have great customer experiences, personalized, relevant customer experiences. So for example, the data shows that while 70% of consumers say they prefer personalized ads and 80% prefer personalized interactions, over half don't want to provide the data that is necessary to fuel precisely the experiences that they demand. And this is what Accenture has called the vicious circle. It arises when consumers' expectation for hyper-relevance collides with their anxiety and anger and resistance to sharing data due to data use and abuse. So Robert, you've talked about in your webinars about the, the switch to contextualiz contextualization. So for example, showing ads based upon what you know about the context of the visitor's uh, the visitor's um, visit, the visitor's appearance on a site, even though you might not know anything about the uh, about the visitor themselves in terms of personal data. Is that the answer to this dilemma? Well, yeah, that's exactly right, right? So as we start thinking about this idea of, you know, what is person, per, you know, personalization versus personaization um, or targeting, you know, for relevance and for better experiences. And if we think about this, right, the kind of experiences that we like for our, you know, our uh, partners or vendors or, uh, you know, things that we get value from to use are the things that make the experience better. You know, the, the one that immediately comes to mind is, you know, when we, when we're, you know, consuming content on Netflix, them knowing that we may want to watch this or this and suggest mm -hmm. things for us or suggest for Amazon to suggest products that may be relevant to what we bought. You know, there are some obvious sort of, you know, fails in that, but of course, but the idea is, is, is that it's contextual. And the idea is, is that it's keeping it within the confines where we get 
really annoyed these days and what I think is maybe at the center of this revolution and, and anger is where the data is used to, quite frankly, serve us more advertising or service, quite frankly, mm. another company. In other words, in the Facebook Cambridge Analytica, it's not about Facebook having our first party data. It's the fact that they use that first party data to make money with another company that used it for another right. nefarious purpose. So yes, it's contextual, but then staying within the limits of providing us with better and sometimes even more persuasive experiences to stay in that experience, but ultimately within the limits of what they control. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, I think that's right. I mean, especially in the area of just advertising, like display advertising, you know, so much of which now is driven by programmatic and, and reigning and, and, and is, as, as our, our friend Johnny Ryan says, programmatic is basically a structural data breach because somebody's personal data has to be shared with dozens, potentially hundreds, actually in some cases, thousands of potential bidders uh, on that particular ad in the microseconds that it takes to, you know, before it's placed uh, when somebody comes to a site. And there's virtually no control over how that data is distributed. And certainly no one's given consent for all of that, uh, all of that distribution and sharing to happen. Uh, and so when you, if you turn to contextualized advertising in, in, in that in that particular context, so to speak, I think this is contextual contextualization has a lot of value and can really uh, kind of address a lot of the uh, a lot of the um, excesses uh, that that have been developed. Um, but I think when you look at it from brand perspective, you know the the kind of things that that our clients are looking to do for their organization for their brand, that consumers are still looking for that. You know, we tend to call it relevance rather than personalization, but looking for, you know, I want you to know me. I want you to know what I've what I've had. I want you to know my limits. I want you to know my taste and my and my, you know, my my distaste. Uh, and so I, I think you still need to try. You, there's a lot of value in in connecting with consumers in a way that uh, that allows you to serve these personalized and relevant experiences. So in that in that sense, um, Accenture draws the kind of obvious conclusion to their vicious circle. That is the only way to break out of that circle. The only way to alleviate consumer anxiety and anger is, you know, to give them control of their data. And now it's no coincidence that the, what we call the prime directive of the GDPR calls for, as you see, putting people in control of their data. And similarly, the opening paragraphs of the CCPA say, fundamental to the right of privacy is the ability of individuals to control the use of their personal information. So again, we're urging you as marketers, your primary task is to satisfy the consumer. Satisfying the regulators and the regulations is, is a nice benefit. But this does show this that there's a that there's an affinity if not a really nice coincidence between consumer demands and regulatory experiences. In other words, it, you needn't worry that by focusing on the consumer, you're somehow undermining your company's compliance efforts. And by the way, here's another great data point. Mere compliance with the regulations doesn't help you access the fuel that you need for great distinctive customer experiences. So in a recent study by a number of academics, the investigators concluded that if you had a proper, fully compliant consent notice, cookie consent notice under the GDPR, it would likely result in an acceptance rate uh, on third party cookies of less than one tenth of one percent. And the obvious question is, if you need access to personal data to fuel these distinctive customer experiences that consumers demand in the first place, how can you increase this opt-in number? Now, clearly with a, with a focus on first-party data, not third-party data. In other words, when every site or app that you visit asks for, I gotta build this, this is a build, ask for um, personal data, what determines whether or not a consumer says yes? Or in the case of the CCPA, what helps determine that a that a what helps encourage a consumer to not use the opt out link to opt out of selling of of their information or does not request that their data should be erased by by a, a given organization or brand. Now we're going to go out on a limb here, although it's a 
it's a pretty short limb, I have to say, and suggest that the answer to this question is trust. Trust is what will, above all else, determine whether a consumer says yes or no to these kinds of questions. So here's our thesis uh, posed as a takeaway. In the current and rapidly involving big data environment, the primary and prerequisite task or challenge for customer experience teams and the large and marketing teams and the large organization that supports them will be creating, nurturing, and sustaining consumer buyer trust. And conveniently, uh, surprisingly, the verification for our thesis is provided immediately and, and very clearly by our friends at the Direct Marketing Association and Axiom, the data broker. In a survey of U.S. adults, again, representative survey of all U.S. adults, trust, as you see, is the clear number one reason that people will share their data. And note that all the way down at the bottom, receiving relevant advertisements, which is typically promoted by the industry as the main benefit of and justification for intrusive data collection is ranked dead last. I mean, really seriously beyond zombie dead last in the DMA survey, in the DMA's own survey. I'm rather surprised that the DMA even published this result. So here's a graphic way of, of, of communicating this. Look at it this way. In the so-called age of the empowered consumer, we, that is, you guys as marketers, vendors, analysts, all of us and you know, service providers, kind of slowly realized and even more slowly reacted, reacted appropriately to the realization that customer experience matters more than the features and benefit of your product or service, speeds and feeds. Right? But we think that success in the future requires realizing that trust now matters more than customer experience, both in the sense that without, without consumer trust, it doesn't matter how good your CX is, it is because consumers probably won't stick around to get to it, and in the sense that without trust, your CX will probably suck for lack of the data to drive relevant experiences. So with this in mind, let's quickly look at a tactical intervention in the closing few minutes that you as marketers can make for the sake of trust and CX. And then in the closing section, we'll explore a couple of strategic considerations. Robert, did you want to say something? No, no, I think, I mean, you know, we have spoken at great length about the idea of trust um, and developing trust as a competitive differentiator. And, and, you know, we can feel it in the popular culture these days where trust yep. is and Edelman has released their trust barometer, um, you know, for the last couple of years and continually seemingly can't go any lower. And then yet it does. <laughs> right. Um, and we don't trust our institutions. We don't trust the media. We don't trust our even friends on Facebook. Um, and so in an era where trust is at an all time low, you know, and, the sad things that that may say about our culture and popular culture mm -hmm. and all of that, it does provide an enormous opportunity for us as marketers to start to become the trusted source of interesting things for the clients we're trying to serve. Yeah, absolutely. So again, so the, the, to conclude this section, let's look at this tactical consideration that we think that you guys as marketers can and should intervene on and can probably get started right away. So back to these cookie consent notices for the GDPR. Again, these are similar kind of scenario with the CCPA's uh, uh, do not sell my, my data link. Um, these things, these cookie consent notices are not just clearly, as you can see, off brand and utterly unengaging and therefore actively undermining customer experience. And by the way, most of them are also illegal that is non-compliant, three recent detailed analyses uh, of, of GDPR cookie, con uh, cookie consent notices confirm what Robert and I have been saying and a lot of others since the, from the beginning, 80 to 90% of these notices or these interactions are currently non-compliant in one or several ways. But I wanna leave all that aside from the perspective of trust, placing this request as the very first interaction, uh, before you can even enter, before you can start using a site or an app, it's like demanding a prenuptial agreement before the first date 
or something like that. It's like buying a used car without driving it, which I realize some people do, but I would never do. I, I, I don't know the right the proper analogy for it, but it's just the opposite of what you should be doing. What we've all learned by now, if you're over you know, 12, yeah, from perhaps painful experience, is that when someone asks you to trust them, or worse, tells you, trust me, tells you to trust them, without providing any evidence why you should trust them, it's probably the best possible reason not to trust them. So an alternative that that we advocate, and in fact, the, the most of the data the data protection authorities in the UK, uh, in the EU have also advocated, is what's usually called just in time consent. So rather than placing that ugly, undifferentiated, brand free, brand corrupting banner right at the beginning, as you see from in these examples from uh, a site called Northern Trails Outfitters, the visitor first gets a request to place a session cookie, not at the beginning, but when only when they have an active shopping cart that they might want to preserve across sessions. Or they get a request for geolocation only after they signed up for a particular outdoor event. Just-in-time consent is about requesting data only when it is needed or relevant. The consumer can then understand why this request has appeared, what value they get out of the exchange if they agree to it, and can comfortably exercise control over that specific data sharing interaction. And Robert, you can see how this would work in more, you know, if I may say so, text-based content marketing scenarios as well, I think, right? Absolutely. You know, I mean, this is the the classic, do we gate our content and make people pay for it with their data versus do we not ask for it and then put a call to action at the end right. of the at the end of the thing that they got, whether it's a white paper or whether it's a, you know, an article or a, or whatever and say, if you like this and want more, please come and sign up. And then once you sign up, then we start to ask and tell you what you're going to get as part of that transaction. Yeah, absolutely. So here's takeaway number four based upon this kind of a, 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 a of approach, although this is more like a desperate plea because I'm, I live in Europe and I'm and I'm so disturbed by how awful these these current cookie consent notices are for for customer experience. Don't allow consent notices to destroy the great customer experiences that you work so hard to create on your site and and uh, and overall. And very importantly, but rarely noted, you are required to present a consent request for every new processing purpose. It's not just limited to first time visitors to your site. It's not, it's not something you can ask once and kind of get it out of the way as if that's an excuse for it. So just in time consent actually accords better with the regulation requirements than, than these first encounter pop-ups and it, and it preserves or does not undermine and destroy customer experience as well. So use your skills as marketers, as content marketers, as CX professionals, as design and interaction and US uh, experts to transform consent interactions from a disagreeable encounter into indeed that first great customer experiences, which, which is what it should be. And takeaway number five follows uh, immediately uh, when, when it brings us back to trust per se, when consumers assert control over data sharing, which you are legally required to grant them by the data regulations and morally, uh, we think, and potentially mortally, if you get it wrong, compelled to do so by what we call the real GDPR, the global data privacy Re uh, revolution, then trust becomes the determinant of business success in this new data environment. Well, and that brings us to the last piece, um, which is where and what is this trust thing and how can you start to build it? Because if trust is truly gonna be the center of our strategy, how do we start to think about it in a way that we can actually start to take advantage of and differentiate on it? Yeah. Um, go ahead and yeah. to the next slide, Tim. Yeah, so Robert, you're gonna address where it is and where it ought to be, and then I'll talk about uh, what it is. Yeah, so you can go ahead and build this out there for, right. I believe. And so the idea here is, is that we, when we think about marketing, there's classic marketing and advertising, and it's basically built on four primary questions, right? One is, do I have your attention? Did I get your attention? Whether we're driving down the freeway and we see a billboard, or whether, quite frankly, it's a banner ad, or whether it's some sort of website, or it's a pop-up, or whatever it is, do I have your attention here? And this is sort of the classic idea of how we're actually getting to 
um, the idea of I have your attention. Then then comes the second question, which is, okay, now I have your attention. Do I have something that you want? Do I have something that you're interested in? Because I know I have your attention, but I'm going to show you that I'm interested. And then finally, we have, do I have your commitment? Because do I have your commitment is sort of the sales close, right? Do I have your commitment to buy this product, to engage, to subscribe, whatever transaction I'm trying to drive? You can see the funnel built into these three questions. And then the final one is, do I have your trust? In other words, because I've delivered what I promised, do I actually have your trust? And the goal, our opportunity, if you want to go to the next slide, mm -hmm. is to actually pull this trust forward. Can we pull that trust forward because in the classic marketing process here and you can see sort of the idea built in of the four questions into our classic marketing funnel is through reach and frequency and this is where third party data comes in I'm trying to deliver you something relevant through a demand generation program that ultimately has you become a visitor or a lead or whatever it is that you have qualified as a potential buyer and then when I'm in that potential buyer stage, I go through a selling stage. Do I have your commitment and ultimately get to customers? And then if you do one more build, it gets to the idea of yeah, are, do I have your trust <laughs> where you're an advocate for me? The, yeah. op, the, the This is the classic marketing process. And, we've, and this is not going away. The funnel's not going away. It's something that is classic and will be there forever. But what we do is we identify markets. In other words, we're identifying buyers out there and convincingly trying to get them to be persuaded to come in, which is the whole idea of using data to be more persuasive. Now, if we go to the next slide, okay. the idea is difference. How is content marketing a different approach? The idea is, is that we're emphasizing the idea of building a trusted audience. In other words, an audience that trusts us, delivering value first. So yes, we start with the idea of anticipated audiences going out and finding audiences that want to uh, engage with us, and we turn them into engaged audiences. Now, I know engagement's got a lot of buzz around it these days, but the idea of an engaged audience is that they will do something for us that an unengaged person won't. But the more valuable thing is, and this is where data comes in, is if we can be, make them addressable, make them want to subscribe. In other words, mm -hmm. give them something of value so that they say, I want more of it, please. And then the idea is, is that once they want more of it on a consistent basis, we deliver it, we build an audience, we can then model it against different business goals, such as delivering a better customer experience, such as helping us do more targeted content, such as helping us create efficiency in the way that we do marketing and advertising. And ultimately that audience becomes a multiplier of efficiency and efficacy of our marketing efforts. And you can go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. And that multiplier as an efficacy grows in two ways. It grows as the audience grows, and it also grows as the number of goals that it supports. And so the idea here is, is that we take what was considered Google's zero moment of trust, which is ultimately the moment of truth rather, and saying, I trust this message or I trust this brand when we ask the first question of, do you trust me, to Tim's con man uh, metaphor, to the mm. second moment of truth that was uh, developed by Procter & Gamble back in the 60s and 70s, um, which was basically, do I trust this experience? And that trust, basically that trust, once we build this experience, one more build, is basically the idea that we want to pull forward. Can mm -hmm. we get the trust us, we're here for you, pulled forward? And so then you can go to the, the, the next slide. There we go. There's and, the second moment of truth. Okay. Yeah. And so once you get that, demonstrated value is the multiplier. So the idea of content marketing basically builds upon the idea of how do we get a multiplier to our traditional funnel? How do we actually deliver value first? so that we're pulling trust forward in the idea of we're here for you, delivering value through content, knowledge, inspiration, entertainment, whatever it happens to be, to make the idea of the, the little con man with the pen and the paper saying, will you, right. you will like us and trust us, others like you like us, more powerful. So that's yeah. the power we have by delivering that value up front. And then you can go to the last slide, which is ultimately the key of all of this. It's just simply treating audiences as customers. We treat our customers really well. We deliver data and we give them the ability to become non-customers, to delete their stuff. The idea is how do we start building trust first by delivering value first 
and just simply treating, treating those audiences as they were customers. That's what Tim is getting to when he talks about the idea of using data and leaning into the use of data and personal data and keeping it within a context. Treating audiences as customers is the way that we can start to differentiate our marketing efforts and lean into the use of first party data to drive better experiences. Yeah, absolutely. And and if you go to to the TCA site to contentadvisory.net, you'll see that one of the ways that we talk about this that, that Robert has so eloquently described is moving trust upstream. That is from the you know basically the post sale trust. I've bought your I've finally bought your product. I've used it. I'm satisfied with it. Now I trust you. That was fine in a way for a while, but now if trust is, we need trust at the beginning. Uh, of not only the beginning of the sales process, the beginning of the customer relationship, so that we can leverage it to get to access that data. And that's what that's why we call it moving trust upstream. Okay, so so to move on to the more strategic considerations at the end, you know, every of course everybody talks about trust. We're not the first ones to do it by a long shot. It's been going on for for some years, from Accenture and Deloitte to the World Economic Forum and so forth. Um, and and references in my experience at marketing. Um, uh, conferences, references to the Edelman Trust Barometer and, and the so-called uh, unprecedented crisis of trust that, that Robert referred to earlier are, you know, are, are beginning to replace the, that MarTech super graphic that you see in the, back, in the background as the most overused, overused slide at, at marketing conferences. But I wonder, maybe the fact that everybody's talking about trust and invoking trust and the need to build trust and, and reclaim trust and address the, address the crisis of trust, maybe that's you know potentially a sign of the problem in a way. And so we have to pause here. Robert and I both have, for, for kind of slightly different reasons, a great affectation for, for Clayton Christensen and have learned so much from Clayton Christensen, who, who very sadly recently passed away. Um, but in a, in a very prescient article from 2000, 20 years ago, uh, Clayton Christensen and his co-author said, understanding a problem is the most crucial step in solving it. And so we might all agree that there's a crisis of trust. I think we do. We, we might agree that we need to build or rebuild trust with prospects and customers and that healthy trust-based relationships are the key to winning with customer experience management. As we said, trust trumps uh, customer experience. But do we, as, as Christensen implies, do we actually understand the problem? Because if we don't, if we misunderstand the problem, or if we understand the wrong problem, or if internally as an organization we have differing understandings, non-compatible understandings of the right problem, then all of our efforts to address this crisis of trust are going to be wasted. So in short, we think that any effort to you know, to increase trust has to start with these foundational questions and an organizational consensus around the answers to these questions. So, what is trust? How can we build or rebuild trust with consumers? What are the elements or components of trust that we should be focusing our attention and our efforts on? And how do we know if we're making any progress? So, here's a a, a widely accepted characterization of trust from the scholars Claire Hill and, and Aaron O'Hara. Trust is a state of mind that enables its possessor to be willing to make herself vulnerable to another, that is to rely on another despite a positive risk that the other will act in a way that can harm the truster. So the important part about this is one, that trust is, is a state of mind, that is it, is it is an attitude held by the truster about the trustee. So in a commercial relationship, it's an attitude of the buyer, let's say, uh, about the seller. Then trust involves vulnerability and it involves some kind of passage into an uncertain future. The other, they say, will act, but the truster doesn't necessarily know how they will act. And that's the, this notion of uncertainty and vulnerability. So the trust researcher, Rachel Botsman, defines trust simply as a confident relationship to uncertainty, which I've modified here for the sake of, of, of emphasizing the future. Trust allows you as the truster to bridge the gap between, between what I now say I'm going to do and the possibility that I may not do it. And by not doing it, I may expose you to some harm 
by not doing what I said. Still, so the question is, how can we increase the amount of trust among our consumers? And this is why I called it earlier, the primary and prerequisite challenge. Building or rebuilding trust is this primary and prerequisite challenge. And, it, and you can see here from just a few citations, it's really easy or it's really easy to find people who agree with this, or it's really hard to find anyone who doesn't agree with it, as you, as you see from these citations. But now that we're at the, at the point of building, rebuilding trust, there's just one problem that appears. And that is that rebuilding trust appears to be impossible. And it's impossible simply because, as we noted, trust is an attitude that consumers have about you as an organization or a brand or, or a product. So as the philosopher Onara O'Neill says, trust is distinctive because it's given by other people. You can't rebuild what other people give you. But what you can do is, give them the basis for giving you their trust. And the question is then simply, what is this basis? What makes you deserving or, pay attention, worthy of trust? And the answer is obviously trustworthiness. You cannot create trust, build trust, any more than you can make someone love you. The only way to increase trust among consumers either the number of people who trust you or the depth of the trust that they feel is to demonstrate and communicate that you are trustworthy, that you are worthy of their trust. And this leads to takeaway number six, which is kind of a, a curious and crucial reversal in the way that, that so many of us has been taught over the last 10 years or so. In the age of customer experience and customer centricity, we're supposed to be obsessively, exclusively focused on the consumer. Remember, move from an inside out perspective to an outside in perspective. But if or when trust is the fuel for successful customer experience, then increasing its power seems to mean concentrating on ourselves, concentrating on what makes us trustworthy and concentrating on communicating that trustworthiness successfully to consumers. Now, we don't want to start scolding people for saying that they that you want to build or rebuild trust with consumers. It's fine to say that. All you need to recognize though, you you know, you can build trust, but those efforts to build trust will be futile unless you recognize that it's not something you do on or to or with consumers but it's rather all about your character, your behavior, your culture and commitments, your organizational ethos, and about how you go about successfully communicating those things. So here are, there are various ideas about the traits by which people judge trustworthiness. So if we, if we, if we have your agreement temporarily at least that you need to focus on your trustworthiness rather than on the trust of the consumers um what is trustworthiness how do you demonstrate trustworthiness so there are various you know characteristics that people count honesty is often included sometimes benevolence i like this set of four that's offered again by rachel botsman with integrity rather than honesty because it's easier for me to think of an organization a corporate person being demonstrating integrity rather than honesty, and the inclusion of empathy, which is a key trait, of course, for customer centricity. Okay? So you can and should begin to determine the appropriate trust pillars for your organization. Maybe it's not these four, maybe it's two others, probably you wouldn't want more than six, maybe it's th maybe it's three different ones. But you know, and and the and and think about the relative weight that each one should carry. But the important thing is that your selection of those trust pillars is based upon what matters to consumers, not what is important for your internal goals or a reflection of your mission statement and so on and so forth. And then very quickly, you can take those pillars that you've selected and you take each one of them. So in this case, the pillar of integrity again, and you can do a trust, what we call a trustworthiness assessment. Now this begins with an internal self-assessment. So how you think you perform on the pillar of integrity. It's crucial 
<laughs> to recognize that this internal assessment, this grade you give yourself is meaningless as a standalone rating because how trustworthy you find yourself, of course, has no relation to how trustworthy consumers find you. But nevertheless, it's crucial to do this self-assessment at the outset in order to precisely to measure the delta between your own internal perception and the external perception of consumers. And so in the in the next and larger part of this assessment, you go and you do and you uh, determine the perception among different consumers at different stages in the in the in the life cycle: audience members, prospects, converted customers. And you need to analyze as well your existing content and processes and tech and government that support the communication and, and delivery of this particular pillar. So this is, you know, a, a, a not trivial undertaking, uh, and it's something that that we've been developing here for over the course of the last year. And it would that trust assessment or trustworthiness assessment would constitute the discovery phase of what you might call a trustworthiness strategic review. And on the basis of these insights, you could set trustworthiness goals and you could map out a plan for getting to and achieving those goals. So final takeaway, number seven, in the era of big data, trust performance indicators, TPIs, are more important than your KPIs in the sense that trust and trustworthiness comes before and is the indispensable enabler of whatever business outcomes your KPIs are measuring. You want to reach a point where your optimized ability to demonstrate and communicate trustworthiness warrants more and deeper trust from consumers, which in turn provides access to more of that scarce personal data, which powers more relevant experiences and, and therefore unlocks even more personal data, and it eventually turns Accenture's vicious circle into a virtuous cycle, which feeds on and continually builds trust during these ever-optimized data exchanges. So final slide, keep your eyes on the real GDPR, the, the global data privacy revolution, address consumers' concerns and demands about data privacy. After that, regulatory compliance is a breeze. Now, that's obviously not a piece of legal advice, nor is anything that we've said in this uh, in this uh, webinar. But I mean in the sense that, as we saw, the, the, the uh, authors of the GDPR and the authors of the CCPA, to take those two prominent examples, very much place contr consumer control of their personal data right at the heart. That's what they want you to achieve. And in the case of the GDPR, they try to avoid prescriptive language telling you, you must do this or that. What you must do is achieve the outcome of placing consumers in control of their data. So if you, in that sense, if you focus on the consumers and their control of their data, then you've done a lot of the work. That's what, that's what we, how we would, how we should put it, of achieving the regulatory uh, consensus as well. Consent exchanges are currently mostly illegal. Uh, predominantly illegal and obviously user hostile, you should instead, as marketers and customer experience professionals, be working to make that the first great customer experience interaction. If you want love, you have to be lovable. It's the only way to, to get love, build love, rebuild love. You want more trust, be more trustworthy. Great content uh, is a big step towards it, but it does not produce trust in and, such, in and of itself. So you need to optimize, analyze and optimize your pillars of trustworthiness and how you go about communicating them. That is, what do we need to communicate in order to demonstrate trustworthiness and how are we doing it? Are we doing it reliably, consistently, so forth? Robert? Fantastic. I mean, this is one of those things where, uh, you know, it, it is it is something that we are dealing with on a daily basis with the uh, with the client work that we're doing and, and all of that, um, you know, Here's the thing, we, we're a minute away from, uh, from it being at time and we wanna make sure that we continue to act trustworthy. So <laughs> there've been a few questions that have come in um, and, uh, and, and in, the, in the spirit of all the questions that have come in, we will certainly follow up with a, uh, with a post here um, that answers some of them, but I will get your opinion on one, on, on this, uh, you know, the, the idea of getting started, right? So the, is yeah. the best place to get started that idea of 
uh, a, a an assessment um, and a content audit, or it, yeah. should we look to you know auditing our audiences or users? Where do you feel like the yeah. best place to start is? Yeah, I would say two things. Um, you know, a little too quickly, but two things. One, yes, a content. I mean, a personal data a data inventory and audit. That is, what data do we currently have? What of it counts according to this or that regulation as personal data? Where did it come from? How did we get it? What kind of consent did we, you know, was wrapped around it when we got it, if any? How do we use it? What value do we get out of it? And, and very importantly, what value can we demonstrate, can we deliver to consumers based upon our use of it? Who do we share it with? Should we be sharing it with them? So on and so forth. All of those things are, are absolutely critical. You must answer all of these questions and you must answer them in a very thorough and complete way in order to comply with virtually any of these regulations because somebody can contact you and say, do you have any of my personal data? You have to have an answer to that question. It can't be, eh, I don't know, maybe, uh, we'll look around. You have to know the answer to that question. Uh, or I want all. I want you to erase my personal data. You have to confidently be able to erase all that personal data, including from the systems of the, of the or, to inform your partners who you've shared it with that it needs to be erased, so on and so forth. So marketing has obviously, you know, marketing is one of the top users of personal data within any organization. So you have to, you have to participate in that effort. You don't lead that effort, but you participate in that effort. I think what marketers do lead and must lead is precisely, as you said, this other, other thing, this assessment, this trustworthiness assessment. So not only, you know, it's a, it's a great new way of looking at content and the value of content in this new environment. Not only are we producing stuff that's engaging and people are coming back for it, but are we successfully communicating in that hopefully really engaging content, our trustworthiness characteristics, so that we're, we're not only just keeping people coming back for more, they're, not, they're coming back to the trough, but we're at the same time, encouraging them to trust us so that when we do pose the request for personal data in order to fuel our customer experiences, we're much more likely to get a positive response to that request. Right on. Well, thank you for that. Thank all of you for joining us today. This has truly been a wonderful uh, experience for me, um, and I hope it was for you. We will be following up with a report. You will also get, obviously, the uh, slides as well as the uh, access to this uh, repeat uh, broadcast. And so thank you all for joining today and we will see you next month on our webinar um, where uh, wherever you may be. Thank you very much. Remember everybody, it is your story to tell. Tell it well. See you soon.